All right, we're going to go on ahead and get started and get our introductions here for our penultimate session of day one. Uh, this is science storytelling for the planetarium. Uh, and and what, a, what a list of panelists we've got this evening. Kachun Yu, Danny LeBlanc, Carolyn Collins-Peterson, and Ryan Wyatt. Guys, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Michael. Um, as uh, Michael says, <laughs> that's our um, list of panelists. I'm Carolyn from Loch Ness Productions, Danny from the Museum of Science in Boston, and Ryan from the California Academy of Sciences. I'm from the Denver Museum of Nation Science, and I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right in and share my screen and we can get started. So um, my uh, presentation is about um, a proposed um, structure or story structure or framework that you can use to create um, your own science stories for planetariums. And before I can talk about that, I want to explain why stories are important. And um, there seems to be a lot of evidence that we as a species are wired for storytelling. Um, it's wired into our brains. And there's research to suggest that stories are easier to read and to remember. And the information in stories are actually perceived to be more truthful than information presented via other means. And then finally, planetariums um, are not the only sources of information from the public about astronomy and topics in space. Content developers in other media are already adept at telling and using stories um, for their media and they've spent much of their careers mastering this art form. And so basically, um, if we can tell effective stories, uh, that's a way for us to be competitive with our peers. Now, one of the biggest proponents of using story in science communication is Randy Olson, who left academia to go to film school and to um, learn how the entertainment industry tell, um, tell stories. And in his workshops and books, he describes two different types of narratives used in science communication. One of them he calls the and, and, and framework. And it's basically just a list of facts. So here is one example where you have a list of facts about Jupiter, all separated by the words and. And the problem with this is that a list of facts is just not very interesting, uh, especially to those who are already not, uh, um, not already enthusiastic about a particular topic. And the other problem with the list of facts is that um, without, um, it basically doesn't really have a point. It just goes kind of on and on. There's no um, climax uh, and it doesn't come to a natural conclusion. So it seems very un unsatisfying. And as a result, this type of story is not memorable. The other type of storytelling is what Wilson calls the and, but, and therefore framework. And it basically follows a three act structure. So the and is the setup where you have introductory statements of facts that everyone can agree upon. The but introduces the conflict where you contradict the previous statements and it adds tension to the story, which makes it interesting to the audience. And then finally, the therefore is the resolution where you resolve the conflict introduced earlier and you conclude the narrative in a uh, reasonable fashion. So um, it turns out that you can um, construct astronomy stories using the and but therefore framework. And uh, I don't have time to go over um, really any detailed examples, but I encourage you to look at the proceedings write up uh, for more information. Um, but um, basically I've identified three different um, types of categories that astronomy stories can fall into. Um, one of them is the individual struggle, which is about the struggle of an individual scientist to, to learn more about the universe. There's also what I call the historical struggle, which follows multiple individuals over a larger span of um, time. And so it's more about um, humanities um, collective efforts to learn about our universe. And finally, there's a third type that I call the misconception-based story, which starts off with the incorrect notions that um, are commonly held, commonly held by the public um, and then introduces uh, contradictory information to try and create doubt about uh, those prior beliefs. So in the end, if you try to use the ABT technique, you'll find that it's much more difficult than um, just listing a bunch of facts using and statements. But I think, I mean, and that of course is because um, you, know, you need to, um, in order to resolve the conflict set up in the and and the but sections, you need to know about the history of scientific discoveries um, that lead to the therefore. But I think creating a story in ABT can actually be really highly um, rewarding because you are forced to understand okay. the, facts, the events that drive the narrative forward and it forces the storyteller to be better edu educated about the topic. All right, thanks. And then um, I think I'll start sharing. And Carolyn is on next. 
Okay. I'm trying to find the share. Uh, here we go. Can you all see that? Okay. Well, it's really good to see everybody here. Um, it's been a while since I've been doing IPS meeting. Um, many of you know me and my work. I've been writing science for about since about 1980. Um, and that includes 50 full dome shows and major exhibits for places like Griffith Observatory and NASA and the California Academy of Sciences. And more recently, I've been doing some work on um, exhibit documents uh, for museums such as in Shanghai. And also I've written books and articles and, and throughout all of that, I've really, um, both as a science communicator and as a research scientist, I really focused on what kind of story we're gonna tell and how we're gonna tell that story. And I've started to, I started a, a long time ago to realize that the audience really plays a part in this. I have to keep the audience in mind. And they're both receptors and, and they're also participants in the storytelling process. We don't usually think about that. I mean, usually they're just sitting there listening and we're telling a story. Um, but I wanna talk about something a little bit different with that. Um, and so my other colleagues here, Danny and Ryan, will be digging into some more of the granular details about writing as Ryan has done, I mean, as Kachan has done. Um, and they're gonna be talking more about script writing and story writing, um, but there are many other aspects that we deal with. So that leaves me free to lay a little bit of uh, what you might wanna think of as philosophical groundwork for stories. The shows we create are, you know, use audio and visual assets. We all know this. And this is whether we're doing it for live or pre-recorded content. What they really are, are conversations with our audiences. People become part of our stories in a way that I'll get to in just a second. Of course, we're working with visual and audio restraints, and those are very exclusive to the dome. And those restraints really define our story in certain ways, particularly its pacing. If things don't happen the same way they would in a movie theater, uh, something for a movie theater, for example. How we construct the story affects the finished product and it then affects the audience. So given those ideas, it's easy to see that our story must be clear, it needs to be linear, and it can follow the formats that, that Kachun was talking about. And, but it has to be simple because we have to make this given material that we want to share with people as simple as understand to possible because they're in this immersive environment as well. Now, when I write for almost any medium, I keep in mind that I'm not just sharing facts and figures. I'm creating a story. And more than that, I'm creating a realm in the reader's mind where the story can happen. And that brings me to some other writers that I've studied, whose, whose work I've studied, and including both Ryan and Danny, actually, because we distribute their shows and I get a chance to look at their scripts. And sometimes I'm looking at their scripts and going, wow, how did they do that? You know. So, But I also turn to writers of other fiction. Uh, and nonfiction for inspiration. So in closing, what I want to do is share with you some thoughts by the science fiction and fantasy writer Lois McMaster Bujold. Uh, she's had some thoughts about how audience and, and writer interact. And in one chapter of her book, Dream River's Dilemma, she talks about the writer's relationship to the reader. Now, it's also applicable in our relationship with our audiences. So I've added some parentheticals here to make it relate to our particular case. And in it, she says, the book, The Full Dome Story, is not an object or a show. It's an event in the reader's mind. It's a process through which the idea in my mind triggers an idea more or less corresponding in yours. The words are merely the means to this end, a sort of think by numbers set, a bottled daydream, if you will. The book or show, therefore, is only finished when somebody reads or experiences it. The book or show is not the story, but merely the, the blueprint of the story, like, like the architect's drawing of a house. The reader, our audience member then, is the, is the contractor, the person who does the actual sweat work of building the dwelling. From the materials in his or her head, the ideas, the images, the previous knowledge, each one actively reconstructs the story experience, each according to their measure, knowledge, gifts, and charity. And she goes on to talk about how they bring their charity to plug in holes in our stories or plug in things that we that they think are missing, but they're actively working with the words we gave them to create this new realm in their heads. So to conclude, I want to leave you with this thought that we are the storytellers as we write our talks, as we write our presentations. However, we need to also respect what our audiences bring to the process of storytelling. And that begins with constructing our story simply, creatively, 
and with space for the audience to help create the realms that we're opening with our stories. Thank you. Come up next, let me start, start sharing. Thank you, Carolyn, for the kind words. Um, and I think I it's meant, really- I meant them. <laughs> I, thank you. And I, I, I mean, I would reinforce them and say, it's so important that we all like learn from each other in the script writing process. And I think that's what encourages us to, you know, try different things and push the medium um, that, you know, there are, there are not that many of us as a planetary collective. And I think it really is, um, it, it says a lot that we can, open our windows to our processes like this. And so yours is a perfect segue. I'm gonna give a more practical look at some of the, the treatments, um, treatments that we've done and the script process that we've done in sort of a practical application and how I approach it. Um, I'm Danny LeBlanc. I'm gonna just um, let the captionings to go. Uh, I am the director of the Charles Hayden Planetarium and Adult Programs in Boston. I've been in the field since 2000. I've been writing planetarium show scripts since 2003. And I, when I just was starting that process, I really valued and clamored for um, just looking at examples of what other people have been doing and how they approached the writing process. And, you know, there wasn't as open of a window. So I'm hoping to share a couple of examples. Um, first, let me just give you a little bit of a background on us. So, um, Amy, we do you need uh, to share your screen? Oh, did I not share it? Ah, I have to click the share button. There we go. So let me go back. That's me. That's my dome. We're a concentric dome. Um, here we go. So we have been producing and storytelling um, in the planetarium, not me personally, but since 1958 with live shows, with pre-recorded shows, we have a history in our dome of creating our own and developing our own content. Um, and one of the points that I wrote in the paper is that you know, good planetarium storytelling is in many ways evergreen. Like the technology changes, but the stories and how we engage our audiences. Um, things that are true, that were true years ago are still true. Um, a compelling story, engaging, all of that. Um, so we've been, I've been writing shows since uh, we were still using slides um, when I started. And then we actually transitioned into digital full dome in 2010. And since then we've produced four shows. We're working on our fifth right now. Um, this is a little bit of, these are the shows that we've done. Hopefully some of these are familiar to you. Um, the one I'm going to use as an example today is Undiscovered Worlds because it um, is, in terms of storytelling, I think it's one of our strongest. Uh, we typically stick to the um, traditional science documentary storytelling style, um, but that did shift a little bit in the spirit of trying new things. Um, for our most recent production, which opened in 2018, Destination Mars, we did attempt to do first person storytelling through the voice of a narrator. This show is all about human space flight and the journey of getting from you know humans back into space to using the International Space Station as our as our as our um, stepping stone to the moon and eventually Mars and to convey the challenges of that long long journey um, really we found could not be done in a third person storytelling uh, science uh, documentary style so we actually went with the first person astronaut and we were fortunate enough to be able to get Dr. Mae Jemison to be able to speak as the astronaut. So that was a, a nice um, tie in for that. And that was an experiment for us, something we hadn't tried before. Um, and I think we were able to pull it off um, fairly successfully for capturing the emotion and the, the challenges of that journey. Um, what I want to do is just real quick um, in four minutes, talk about, or probably not two minutes, talk about what takes a year and a half to actually do. But the two stages that we really work on are the treatment, which is kind of like our fleshed out narrative outline. It's the story's backbone and guides the pacing and flow. Um, and really that's what captures, it starts out as a series of sketches and it captures the most powerful visual scenes. It helps us um, establish the timings of things on a very, very loose way. But our process is incredibly iterative. It's incredibly messy. Um, and it's definitely does not come out perfect the, the first time out. The script is where we then flesh out the treatment and we start developing those scenes it does not happen in chronological order. I don't write from beginning to end. I write the scenes that I am picturing the, the most and the hardest, and then I sort of build things around that. And again, it's very iterative with the process of the visuals. Um, let me stop this. I think I probably just have time to share one thing, but I think I'm going to share the, um, the a treatment that we have for exoplanets. And can everyone see that? Is it big enough? 
Can you see it? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so this is the show treatment. This is, and you can see we did this, this was 2010. This is um, about a, a little bit less than a year out from when the show was actually released. So this is an early document that evolves um, in the first part of the process. And then it, it becomes, it's great because it becomes like a summary that you can use for marketing and all kinds of things, but it's really the place where we flesh out the flow of the show. Um, we always use science advisors. Some of these names might be familiar to many of you. Um, they all worked on the script. They all commented, marked it up um, and gave us their, their common, uh, their, their feedback on, um, based on their research at the time. And the reason that we even selected the show falls right into that excitement and engagement. It's we picked a topic that was very, very highly in the news. It still is. But in 2010, Kepler had just launched in 2009. So that we were waiting for results from that. And there was a lot of, a lot of natural interest that we were able to capture and tell that story in a way that people were, um, were naturally excited about. Um, it, outlines the main goals element, you know, highlighting the element of surprise and astonishment to stay true to the, the science of exoplanet discovery and then using the new to us at the time database, the real database that we had and we're very excited to use. Um, it outlines, if I bring it down to here, I can just show you like a sample of the introduction um, and how we bro broke things out. Again, it's just a, a set of sketches of of concepts, um, you know, sometimes you come up with a really great line that you think you're going to use in the script, and you might jot it down here, and or maybe you come up with a really great scene in your mind, like, wouldn't it be great if we did this? So we have this possible show opening um, that we had described it in the treatment early on as as this full dome scene of a fantasy exoplanet. We did end up using it, um, but this show opening, as we describe it here, actually turned into two different scenes. So there are things like that that, in practice, as you're moving it, you evolve it. Um, but it's just, it's a place to, to put those ideas and to start developing them. Um, I can do, how am I on time? Am I out? Uh, Danny, you have three minutes left. Three minutes. Oh, for the, yeah, but Ryan has to go. Oh, yes. So okay. three minutes. So total. I'm going <laughs> to hand it over to Ryan. Um, and if anybody has any questions or want to see examples, I'm more than happy to share the scripts that we have. Because like I said, we really can um, learn from each other. So thank you. Thank you, Danny, for uh, for laying the groundwork for something that actually I you now don't need to talk about because I think our process is actually very similar in terms of how we um, uh, how we create a treatment and work up from that. So I, I think it's it's as Danny said, it's great to share share these sort of uh, processes and kind of commonalities. What I wanted to talk about is a little bit of a pivot that we did at the California Academy of Sciences in terms of the way we approached the production of big astronomy that you heard about earlier today. Um, so I think of this as uh, expanding what I call Academy style. Uh, I wrote about this in uh, the Planetarian last year. Um, we're kind of obscuring the, the URL, but it's tinyurl.com academy hyphen style is uh, where you can download the article. Just look for the June issue of the Planetarian. It outlines kind of a process that I think has been inspired by the way we try to tell stories at the California Academy of Sciences, which is when you really boil it down about creating human-centered context, something that uh, I think uh, Carolyn addressed really well. Part of that is uh, starting at human scale, uh, but then also minimizing cognitive load, which is sort of like respecting your audience. Uh, and to do that, maintaining camera motion and continuity, keeping visualizations easy to read, uh, those are kind of the hallmarks of our traditional productions. But when we started the process of creating big astronomy, we knew we needed to do something different. The backbone of this show is not just written from uh, our own idea of what the show should be about. We want to tell the story of different people who do astronomy, who work at major observatories in Chile. And to do that, the backbone of the show is a series of interviews. We actually interviewed uh, nearly 30 people in both Spanish and English, which formed the foundation of both the English and Spanish versions of the show. And those interviews, uh, we didn't uh, end up shooting full dome footage of people talking on the dome, but those interviews become the foundation of the soundtrack. And then we captured visuals by going back to Chile a few times uh, to create create full-time experiences that complemented the words. So we interviewed people, we pieced together 
uh, their narration. And then we had a, a, an astronomer narrator carry through the entire piece. This is a very new way of working for us. Uh, and one of the things that we wanted to do when we captured the full dome footage that would complement the interviews is we wanted to keep the camera moving. So one of the main issues that uh, I have with a lot of camera work that's done in the dome is that if you have a static camera, everything kind of loses its dimensionality on the dome. Uh, I'll just mention that uh, Ken Ackerman and Mike Schmidt, two of the key people on the Academy production team, will be talking about this on the third immersive day on August 28th. Uh, but these are just some of the things that we did in terms of mounting the camera that we used, which by the way, was a Sony Venice with a Canon uh, fisheye lens. We mounted it on a jib to get some up and down motion, uh, a Dana dolly to get uh, lateral horizontal movement, and then a three axis stabilizer, basically this uh, Ronin handheld kind of steady cam like mount uh, that allowed us to actually walk with the camera uh, through spaces, which uh, for details that I won't go into, uh, you'll notice that the, that the head of the camera is split off from the electronics of the camera. It's something that we wouldn't have been able to do with other cameras. We also integrated that then with uh, an astronomy story. So knowing that people come to the planetarium for astronomy, we wove an astronomy story in with the human story. And this, uh, this creates as a whole, uh, what we hope is a, an experience that not only tells the human story, but also a story about astronomy using visualizations as we always do, uh, that, um, uh, that is what people expect in coming to the planetarium. So we really forced us to kind of rethink how we approached piecing together a story. Uh, and we kind of started with those touchstones of uh, astronomical visualizations and then wove a story in between them. Uh, I'll just note briefly that this, the show is also available in Spanish uh, and uh, you can go to our website, bigastronomy.org, to, to find out more. But I think fundamentally that, uh, again, it's really just taking some of the lessons that I think Carolyn and Danny described very well in terms of how we conceive of story and then reworking uh, the, the way that we have worked for a very long time, for the last 12 years, uh, to think about how we could sort of mix it up uh, to support the story that we needed and wanted to tell. And again, I'll just put a final plug there, uh, more about the camera and technology on Immersive Day, uh, the third day of Immersive, the third Immersive Day on August 28th.